Hello, and welcome to the live broadcast of the Doctors Without Borders Three Question Series. We're coming to you from Oakland, California today. We're at the start of the California leg of our traveling exhibition about the global refugee crisis called Force From Home. Um, this will be a 30 minute segment and we'll jump right in, but I just wanted to let you know that we'll be referring to the organization as MSF. MSF is the acronym of the French name of the organization, Médecins Sans Frontières, and we use the names interchangeably. So when you hear MSF, that means Doctors Without Borders. So we'll introduce our experienced field workers. Um, Chris Sara has developed and managed programs for people seeking refuge in Europe including a search and rescue project for people making the dangerous crossing of the Mediterranean and Aegean seas. She's recently managed medical initiatives for people seeking asylum in Athens, Greece. Liza Ramlow is a midwife who's worked with women and children who've had to flee their homes in Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and South Sudan, among other countries. Most recently, she's worked on MSF's search and rescue ship the Aquarius in the Mediterranean. Sachin Desai is a pediatrician who's worked in countries throughout Asia and Africa. Most recently, he provided medical care in Nindutsa refugee camp in Tanzania to people who fled the political violence in Burundi. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question we'll start with is what did they take with them? Um, in the United States, there have been a string of disasters lately, uh, wildfires and hurricanes, and a lot of the stories that we've heard coming out of these disasters have echoed a lot of the stories that we hear from our own patients who were forced from their homes all over the world. One of the recurring themes is having to make those really difficult decisions about what to bring and what you have to leave behind. So I'm hoping you guys can each tell a story about a patient or a situation where people you've worked with have had to make that really difficult decision. So Chris, we'll start with you. Well, well, you know, it depends. Most of the times people come over and they just have a backpack or a bag with their precious stuff. And, and sometimes they leave behind the, it's not what they leave behind in terms of material. It's that sometimes they even leave behind their family. They get separated by family members. They, uh, they may have to do the crossing and in one boat you might have the parents and then on the other boat you may have their children. Or you may see people uh, reaching their shores and trying to reunite with their, their relatives. And... Um, and I don't know. I've I've seen I've seen this this uh, these scenes where a mom tries to find the child in the middle of nowhere when they are getting out of their boats. And uh, I don't think they care about what they have with them most of the times. What they care about is to make sure that uh, they are all safe. And uh, they may have somewhere uh, put in a five uh, five bags and trapped uh, their phones or the their passports and their health booklets or the health booklets of their children and um, that's how they they come over mm -hmm. and sometimes they might even have nothing mm -hmm. and for, for me I would say I think it's just bears repeating and it's probably a recurring theme but these people, they're accustomed to just the most amazing challenges every day, just in their regular lives and the settings that they're living in. So when they're forced from their homes and leaving, it's just, it is, it's so bad that they're trying to take whatever they can. And uh, Chris, like you're saying, you know, it's whether it be family members and sometimes the reality of leaving your family members and anything you can just, a lot of times children taking things to remember their, their family members or even, you know, other things that just kind of give them memories of home and family members. And that, that's, the idea is one challenge after another but trying to keep strength through, you know, um, through friends and family. And I would say that 
<clears throat> well, I'm thinking immediately of Doro Camp in, in South Sudan, where people, the, the, the group of people who, that we met who had just been bombed out of their village on the border between South Sudan and Sudan, um, had also been sent into Ethiopia about 20, 25 years before that. So they moved as a group, moved back to their homes, moved again when they were bombed. And the women, it seemed to me, were, were uh, very sort of used to taking, as you say, used to taking whatever they could, whatever little bit they could, to maintain some sense of their community. Um, which also changed, like they'd acquired a coffee habit in Ethiopia. Yeah. So then when they arrived in Doro Camp, they had this, this little coffee making kit over the fire, which wasn't typical for them. I also uh, admired the midwives, who, who are birth attendants, who had gotten training wherever they could during this long series of displacements. And they would pull from their clothing uh, plastic bags full of whatever certificates they had gotten from any kind of educational program they attended. Those things stick in my mind. I think That's it's interesting better. what social currency is, how social currency is defined in these kind of settings because, you know, what does money mean if no one's willing yeah. to accept it versus yeah. a school certificate or something that will help you survive and you and your family survive in the coming days. And it's something that sometimes you can't plan for that. You don't know what no, you're going to yeah. bring. You can think about it, but then what's going to help and what's, gonna, you know, it's, it's kind of finding it and picking your next adventure, but really getting by with what you have. Well, it can, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No. It can be even a, you know, sometimes people bring family photos or they have, I've seen them having their cell phones uh, without a SIM card, but having it because they have the, their photos in it. Yeah. So they keep the phones just to go and scroll down and, and take their, their, their photos. And um, it might come with a guitar. Uh, once we had uh, someone who came with uh, with his dog, so he opened the life jacket and a puppy <laughs> popped up, and I couldn't believe it, but that, that's life. Uh, they say that the, that the, one of the cruelest parts of being a refugee is losing your sense of who you are. You don't even know who you are, and these little bits mm. must be a, a part of what people hold on to to maintain their sense of self and yeah. belonging this this reminds me one uh, after one rescue there was a Syrian father he came he did the crossing from Turkey to Greece with uh, uh, his three children and his wife so once they stepped out and they got um, the children safe and the mom and uh, we asked the father to come with us so he could take uh, dry clothes and get registered and then proceed to go to the reception facilities and he didn't want to do that and he stepped out and asked for a tea mm -hmm. so he wanted to have the tea <laughs> calm down get himself together and uh and uh, feel like a human being. Like a human know? being. And he even yeah. had his wet clothes on him. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to change. He wanted to, and he paid for his tea. I remember that. So we wanted him to to get it for free, and he refused. He wanted to pay, get his tea, mm -hmm. and go back. That sense of normalcy is mm -hmm. is something that comes up a lot. That longing for some sense of normalcy. Yeah. And that leads to our second question, which is, um, what is it like in these spaces where people are displaced, these temporary spaces? Sometimes when people have to flee their homes, eventually they, they land somewhere where they can take refuge for a little while, whether it's an official refugee camp or a transit camp or a search and rescue ship, somewhere like that where they no doubt have a, an immediate sense of relief but then they're also confronted with a whole new set of uh, conflicts and emotions that they have to deal with. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys can, can talk about that. How have you seen people dealing with um, the challenges of being in one of these trans, you know, transit spots where you don't really know what's gonna happen next, but you, uh, you're concerned for the future, you're trying to find a sense of normalcy. What, what have you guys seen? Yeah, I, I 
think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's a daily challenge. It's a daily grind. Um, this sense of normalcy is not static. It's a, it's a moving target. So you are trying to find something for that day. And then next day, it's just the settings may change. The conditions may change. Again, food, water, shelter are always going to be on the top of people's you know, priority list for them and their families. But how do you survive? How do you keep communication links? Um, and again, the, the challenges of even just finding the proper places to sleep you know, in overcrowded situations, even, you know, bathrooms, getting enough water, getting water can take a whole day, it can be a whole day's activity, a lot of times, mm-hmm. walking, and if you're caring for the whole family, that means you're, if you're getting enough water, even, that means you're carrying lots of amount, and it's, it's the women and children that are mostly doing this, so it's a challenge after a challenge after a challenge to find that sense of normalcy, which a lot of times can be, you know, um, changing from day to day. Conditions are typically not, not great. I think you can speak better to that, Chris, than I can. But I know that, for instance, in Doro Camp, every family had a tree and was, they were under a tree and they, they hoped that they had found a tree that wasn't going to be flooded out. I mean, what little they had might disappear <laughs> if the rains were bad enough. Um, and yeah. uh, you, you've spoken about the situations that you've seen in Greece. I don't know if... I don't know. I don't really know what life is like for them, how they, the, how they feel. But I, I assume that the hardest part is being somewhere without knowing what comes next, without knowing how the future will look like, without knowing if your asylum application will be accepted or rejected, or if your uh, family reunification process will be fast or not, and if you're gonna be reallocated somewhere or not. And and, uh, Shatsin, you mentioned communication, and that's one of the most important things they, people miss when they they live in uh, uh, detention centers or reception facilities most important thing or what they would ask you immediately is uh, how they can access Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi most of the times is the only means they have to get connected with their uh, families back home in places uh, that Wi-Fi exists and um, or I don't know. I don't really know how they feel. And I, I suspect that I just assume that the hardest part is not knowing what your future is going to be like. That brings up a, a question that I, I want to direct to, to Liza because um, being a midwife, you, you interact with pregnant women a lot um, who've been displaced. And um, how do pregnant women in particular react to being in these transit places where you don't know you know what you're going to be uh, birthing your baby into mm-hmm. or what's going to be available for you once you do give birth I think often in places of transit actually pregnant women are chosen for for care maybe more than other people women and kids I would say because that's sort of a, a, a world worldwide way of triaging pregnant women and kids get attention but uh, that I I am impressed with the fact that for most pregnant women the pregnancy itself is um, is not a top priority why not because the baby isn't important to that woman but because she's just struggling to survive to figure out the survival of her other kids to connect with the people at home who need to know that she's still alive in in uh, in the detention centers in Libya, many cruel stories were recorded about women having to deliver right in the middle of, of a room full of a hundred people and without any care at all. But they just want to survive. They just have to survive in, in order to keep going and find a new life somewhere. Yeah. All the other challenges are not put on hold, so. It's almost like a add-on, and I think 
that idea of not knowing what comes next, it's also that element of even food. There are some places where we've been in South Sudan or Burundi where we have green areas, but not knowing the ability to plant your seeds and then having to move within a month yeah. before your crops even grow, that can drive you crazy. That's something where you do have some access, but you have no control of defining your own normalcy or you have very limited mm -hmm. control. And again, that is almost a daily mental health stress and it adds on just in addition to all the other challenges. So it's a struggle after a struggle. And having the, the, the struggle to, to find something to do with mm -hmm. your days and your time because a, a few months before you might have a, a job, getting your kids to school, having a, a full program in your life and then you end up living in a tent and you have nothing to do or nothing to do to, 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 to even spend your time. Mm -hmm. uh, these are not people without skills. These are teachers, these are physicians, these are cobblers, these are carpenters, these are people who are often who are used to earning their living in a way that's meaningful to them. And, um, and that's all blown away. Sachin, when you were working um, in Tanzania in Ndusa camp, um, did you meet a lot of young people? Um, when when Burundi became became impacted by this political crisis, I know a lot of people who who had to leave were younger. Um, what was it like uh, when you talked to to a lot of the younger people there who had landed in this refugee camp, but so the the time of their life when they would normally be starting their careers or their families? Did you do you uh, have any stories from that time? Yeah, you know. We talk of it, the reality for sure is people's, you know, possessions, homes, uh, all these things are taken from them. You sometimes even split up from family. But one thing we forget to mention is everyone, especially young people, their dreams are taken away. And that's the hardest part because you're talking about professional dreams, you're talking about just life plans of getting married, having children which is very important. So all of a sudden this happens, and sometimes we don't think of it as tangible, but it can be the most important thing in someone's life where they, they again, live a tough, tough life. You know, their daily life may be very tough, but this is something that they think they have planned and all this, and then the sudden change, everything's on hold because when you don't have the ability to even know what's happening next or you know have some income for your family these even the idea of joining families and and kind of you know creating a partnership with someone that's that's also taken away as well it's like if someone holds your life in in, in his hands yeah. it's as if your life is no longer yours and someone will decide how it's going to be from now on and uh, it creates dependency but it, it creates a dependency that you you don't wish to have and you can do anything to change it in some some cases I'm thinking just now of, uh, of so many women on the boat out in the Mediterranean who had whose families had supported their coming to Libya in hopes of, 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 of surviving, for instance, the attacks of the terrorist group Boko Haram in the northeast of Nigeria, other places. And their families had supported that, and then they often have to pay money al along the way. This sm whole smuggling trade is it's, it's enormously complicated and expensive. And then there they are in these situations, like on the boat or in a, a detention center in southern Italy, and they they really feel responsible to their families at home and they will say repeatedly I'm the oldest daughter I, I my mother has only me and I need to figure out a way to send support home I've got to find a job right away I've, I've got to work in order to help my sister or whoever all right well um, the third question that I have for you guys is uh, how has knowing displaced people impacted you? 
uh, inevitably working in the places where MSF works, it alters your perspective and it's not something that everybody gets the opportunity to do, to get to know people who've been displaced or forced from their homes. Um, and it gives you a different perspective than a lot of people who um, you might come home to afterwards. Uh, so I wondered if you guys could talk about the challenges that that presents in coming home from such a different situation and whether you have found a way to sort of communicate your perspective to people that's, um, that's productive. When I come home, I find myself talking a lot about the amazing strength and resilience of the people that I have met in the field. The midwives, for instance, who who work, who stay in place in their jobs even though they're never paid or they move with their group from one uh, place to another and uh, deliver babies over 25 years uh, with no particular remuneration. But um, And then the strength of people in general. I mean, it's absolutely amazing what they survive. I, I can't even imagine living through the journey from, say, Nigeria to Italy across the Mediterranean. Um, I also I also think a lot about gratitude and how, how none of us in this world has anything that we are not grateful for. If we don't have gratitude for it, we don't really have it. I think also uh, that's that's amazing. I, I will say, yeah, it really, you sit down and you just take some time and you think and for me um, just the simple idea that majority of people want to live in peace and provide for their family that's the reality of these tough tough settings whether it be conflict whether it be after disaster um, majority of people they are talking about hey how do I you know even the idea of just living together reunifying all these issues you start to realize it's always a small percentage of people that you know create problems for the rest and the majority just want to you know go on living their lives and uh, moving on with their families so that's reality and coming back home you even sometimes when you're hearing and talking to your colleagues and friends back there they just can't grasp sometimes the challenges and the squabbles over what we're having over here. <laughs> and so it is something that you kind of look at and say, even look back and say, hey, we have significant issues that need to be discussed here for sure. But that is important to kind of hear from that, you know, fresh kind of way of thinking and saying, look, look what we're dealing with. And again, not to quantify that this is worse than the other, but to kind of say, hey, these are things we can get through, but let's let's start the discussion. So on both sides, you kind of see, and it puts it into perspective on, on how to move forward with, with really trying challenges mm -hmm. and the way forward. I, I think often about how, uh, how I, I am descended from people. I think my great-grandfather fled Germany because he'd done something that wasn't entirely legal <laughs> and ended up in this country. You know, we're all children of, of immigrants, um, if not refugees. And we, we, were, we should be very grateful for the opportunities that we've had to establish new lives as our, in our families. And I would like to think that we'd be willing to share with the others who are simply struggling, as Sitchin says, to create a good life and find peace, find enough to feed their families. I think very often um, it made me understand how life can change from one moment to the other. And uh, the stories of people from one day to the other, that they became deaf refugees from one day to the other. and like a month ago they may had their house having their children going to school and living their lives and then all of a sudden they're somewhere crossing the med or they are in a reception center 
<clears throat> in Europe or wherever and they don't know if they ever are going to have the chance to go back or not uh, and when I go back uh, home or when I try to discuss with people sometimes I get very frustrated and very angry and I, I, I just don't understand how is it possible to let this thing happening and then I try to reason with people and and try to find ways to to explain and I guess it, there is no right way to to speak about that and most of the times it has to do with feelings and it's it's not about the level of education or the social status or the economic situation that people have when they are so solidarity to refugees or when they step out and they go to help and and live together and live with them and and try to restore dignity and restore humanity it's something that you can see from anyone and from people who had no previous experience or they had never seen in their lives a refugee before and then all of a sudden they open their hearts and they open their minds and they stand stand by their fellow citizens mm -hmm. and uh, I wish to believe that I became a better person with this experience but I never know <laughs> and Chris you've even um, started programs in your hometown mm -hmm. in Athens, Greece, to welcome refugees. Yeah. So you must have experienced this. I experienced this, this, this thing that people without knowing anything, they just see a mom with, their, with, their, uh, with her children or a family or a single man and they say, no, it's not right that they live in the streets. No, it's not right that they had to cross the Mediterranean in a plastic boat to get uh, to Europe and ask for asylum. So I, I'm gonna act. And they, the only thing that they can do, which is the biggest thing sometimes, is to open their house and get them inside. And that's, that's something that, that's the whole meaning of, of living together and showing solidarity, sharing your lives. And uh, it's this feeling that it's not right. It's not right having children who survived bombings and who survived war to have them dying in the sea while crossing uh, the sea to, 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 to do what? To seek a better life. Mm -hmm. that, that could be me. That could have been my family. That could have Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how it feels, you know, getting on a boat, having a, a, a parent being on a boat with their children and knowing that the children cannot swim, for example. How does this feel? How do you take this decision? How do you, how do you take this decision? You take this decision because you have no choice. No choice. That's it. It's not a matter of deciding to stay or to go. It's only to go. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we talk about, um, you know, what it means to us when we're going back, it's also interesting, I guess, reflecting on, hey, when people don't understand and, you know, constantly kind of bringing up the discussion of what are people threatened by? So you start to kind of, at least, you know, we start to think about that and, and a lot of times the understanding of when people who want to contribute to society and can make the society stronger, it's again that social investment, which becomes a really interesting discussion point. And yeah, we won't solve these things right away. But I think, you know, through these disasters and these unfortunate settings, you know, these crises, it, it, people who are willing to discuss and try to understand on both sides first of all the challenges of the refugee crisis but also i think when we try to understand people who do are threatened by this or don't understand that also i think helps move the discussions forward and a lot of times mm -hmm. uh, advance it you know um, mm -hmm. okay we have time to take a bonus question from our social media followers um Several of our social media followers actually 
uh, have been asking about what it's like to work across cultures. What sort of challenges do MSF field workers face when you're trying to work with people um, or provide care to people who come from totally different cultures and different norms and, um, and different rules? So I was wondering if each of you could speak from your own experiences about overcoming cultural barriers when you're trying to provide care to displaced people and, and what those barriers look like. Um, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, working in each setting has its own challenges. Languages and customs, that's something just by talking to everyone and working together and sharing a meal, you can, you really move forward just kind of understanding and it makes just work that much better. It makes, you know, life, uh, understanding in those kind of contexts, just, you know, really living life and your job all together. Um, recently, upon returning from uh, the Burundian refugee crisis along the Tanzania Burundian border, um, I went down to Houston to help out with some of the recovery efforts. And I think, I think that was a great kind of parallel where you start to realize we're all American citizens. Everyone was an American citizen in Houston, but with very different backgrounds and cultures. And unfortunately, it took a disaster for everyone to kind of band together. And I guess that's kind of what we see out there in a different level. Um, it really is people at their most vulnerable times having to join together for the strength of the whole. Sometimes it's also the, the the fear that you have in advance. So before working with people who come from different cultures, without saying that differences don't exist, you already have some misconceptions and fear that comes from you. So once you make the first contact and once you start overcoming language barriers, which of course are a big, big issue, then you see that there are not so many things that you cannot just put aside and move on and work together or provide the, the quality of care that you want to have. In some ways, I think it's a, it, it's a huge gift to me to be taken out, out of my typical comfort zone. Medical, medical comfort zone. I'm thinking again of Doro Camp in which I was working with traditional birth attendants, um, trying to put together a, a staffing pattern for the maternity hospital. And none of them had owned a watch. That, some of them had watches, but they never worked. They just were an uh, item of decoration. Um, they, had, they didn't read English any more than I read Arabic, which I don't. Um, so a, a schedule <laughs> had to. We had to figure out a schedule that somehow referred to where the sun was. Yeah. And I, you know, the, I, they'd never signed their name on a document ever. They they'd never written it. I was just amazed. I thought, all right, how do we do this? How do, how do we come together so that I can teach you how to give an injection if it's needed? How to give medication if it's needed? How to how to come when you're due here so that we have staffing for the maternity hospital um, and, and yeah. this goes vice versa as you were yeah, yeah. saying because yeah. the same way we don't know we don't speak arabic or some yeah. of us don't the same way they when we have a patient who doesn't speak english or who cannot read english and you're giving the medication and there is this old english letters around the box and they don't know what it is or Imagine being a woman giving birth to, to your child in a clinic in somewhere in a place that you have never visited yeah. before and you have to trust the person who doesn't speak your language and who doesn't who even have the same characteristics with you and you don't look, yeah. that, nothing yeah. seems familiar, nothing yeah. looks familiar and all of a sudden you have to trust your life. That's yeah. where like, yeah. even languages I found that Hey, you try and you speak it and everyone laughs at you, at yeah. least you got a smile on their face. Yeah. That's yeah. like the, the best thing. Again, sharing a meal, you know, getting destroyed on the football field by eight-year-old kids and everything, living in the camp. 
you're creating that bond that you're part of the community and that that kind of gets into you know just doing your job versus being part of the community even your security standards are improved because you're living as part and yes there will be maybe disagreements but when you're part of the community that makes all the difference of people working together and trying to chip away at all the many many mountains of challenges there's so much that you can work with that crosses cultures and and also such strength in bringing them together. We're, we're really stronger when we have a mix of, of approaches to life and ways of doing things. And learning goes both ways. Yeah. It, it certainly does. Yeah. All right, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. And um, please Thank subscribe you. to our YouTube channel <laughs> and watch our other three questions videos. So thanks to all of our participants and thanks to our audience. Thank you. Thank you.